a special message from this month's presenting sponsor. Learn about Baltimore's rich industrial legacy through working galleries that explore the history of the Bethlehem steel mill, an antique print shop, a garment loft, and more at the Baltimore Museum of Industry. The BMI, hours and information at thebmi.org. Also, use the code TRUTH50, that is TRUTH50, it's my special code, and get 50% off of admission at the front desk or use it when purchasing the tickets online. So please visit thebmi.org and make that trip today. Welcome to The Truth in This Art. I am your host, Rob Lee. And today I have the privilege of speaking with a Baltimore native, performer, author, filmmaker, educator, dancer. I'm going to keep going. Please welcome Nia June. Welcome to the podcast. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming on. Um, yes. This is uh, going to be fun. Um, you know, like all of the hyphenated like superlatives, all of the titles, all of the background. It's just like it opens it up for a much broader discussion. So thank you for mm -hmm. making the time. Yeah. Uh, so obviously, I stole the entire intro line I had for offline. So I want to have you introduce yourself and you know share something that recently <laughs> um, share something that recently brought you some joy. Yeah. So um, my name is Nia June. Obviously, I am all of those things. I just shorten it by saying I'm a multidisciplinary artist. <laughs> Um, I am an arts educator, so I teach with uh, Muse 360. Shout out to them. It's an amazing organization. I teach dance and I teach uh, film and creative writing to youth that are my dancers are like between three and five. And then my creative writing and film students are in high school. So it's a good mix there. Um, yeah, I have films out. I work primarily with Kirby Griffin and a poet named Nate. Um, they're my favorites. You should definitely check them out. And yeah, I'm a creative. Everything I do, I try to create as much as possible in all of my different mediums. That's great. Um, yeah. So what, what's brought you joy recently? Oh, yes. What brought me joy? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to say my babies, my dancers. Um, I teach, so I teach dance. I don't necessarily teach ballet or modern or a specific type because they're so young. So we just learn how to move. So they're just learning how to move their bodies to music. And they brought me so much joy because they really like dancing. And I think that, you know, learning something new can come off a little boring to kids because it's super disciplined, but just seeing them so excited and they're dancing to the Wiz, which is an amazing soundtrack. <laughs> So, and it's beyond their time. So seeing them touch in with like Michael Jackson, Diana yeah. Ross, and yeah, that just warmed my heart up. That's great. Yeah. A little Nipsey Russell in there too. I recently uh, mm -hmm. watched that. We did this this trade. Um, I trade movies with my with my partner on occasion. So it's like yeah. you've never seen The Wiz. I was like, Nah, I've never seen The Wiz. <laughs> and she was like, So you're gonna have to watch it. I'll trade you a movie. And I was like, All right, I'm gonna trade you Rocky for. She was like, That's a specific choice you just made. <laughs> so we traded it, and both of the movies are about even in rating. So I was just like, Oh wow, man, that's a lot of stuff happening. In this movie and I'm enjoying it and she's like oh, I gotta watch Rocky now ill <laughs> <laughs> yeah so, yeah so how is your diverse background including like all of the things that you know was mentioned that multidisciplinary background how have they um like how have they served each other like for instance um is there something from your background in dance that makes you a better filmmaker what is that through line between all of the the different mediums and different practices that you work within yeah um I think that I'm very fortunate to be, you know, fluent in so many different styles. And I think that it has always made my work um, as universal as it can be, mm -hmm. uh, at least within the black community, because a lot of my work is around being black. And um, it's universal in that way, because uh, if someone isn't really into poetry, but they love movement mm -hmm. or they love images, they have all of these options to pick from within the work. So, specifically with film, it has definitely serve me because all of my films have dancing in it. You know, there's always some room for a dancer or it's sprinkled in between. And um, same thing with poetry. All of the film incorporates poetry as well. And I think as far as the creative process is concerned, I think that subconsciously, I'm, I'm not able to name exactly how they feed each other, but I know that subconsciously, you know, when I'm deciding how 
um, a poem is going to flow on the page. I'm also coming from this movement background, like the way that the words may dance or the way that they sound. I'm thinking about the way I was trained to listen to music and to use that to move the body, if that makes sense. No, it does. So I think that just with the way I'm naturally trained to think from the bottom up, you know, from a child to now, that definitely lends the way that I write. And then when you throw film on top of that, a lot of my films come off as poetry, in my opinion, like the way that they line up. It's like a collage of images. The story isn't linear. You know, there's a lot there's a lot of metaphors that are visual that you have to figure out. So, yeah, they intersect all the time, 100 percent. And I'm, I'm truly grateful again to just know all these different styles. Uh, that's great. It makes yeah. it it's, it's almost the. The thing, I guess it's a Bruce Lee quote, like, my style is having no style. And it's like all of these things have gone together to make your own way of approaching something. So that's really great to hear. Yep. Let's talk about perception a little bit. I'm always interested in what a creative, what an artist has to say about, like, perception when it comes to their work. Like, what role does emotion play in your work at a macro level? Like... You know, some people may, I can only paint when I'm really happy or I can only mm-hmm. play guitar when I'm mad. So so tell me about that. Oh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, emotions are huge in my work. Um, it's like if actually if I can't feel it, then I can't do it. And, you know, it makes it hard for me to accept commission pieces. And it's not saying that I don't care about what I'm being asked to write about. But again, I have to be very particular because again, if it's not coming from the heart, if it's not like in my blood, it's really hard for me to put it on page to my best. Um, But to go back to the place of, you know, I can only write when I'm happy or sad. I think that, and I was just talking to somebody about this. I think that it doesn't really matter for me necessarily, but a lot of my work is coming from a place of pain. So like right now I'm in a beautiful space in my life. But there are so many things that I've gone through that I haven't even written about yet. So I have to, I'm still dwelling on those things. I'm still processing them. I'm still looking at them in new ways. And I think as I grow, I'll always look at my past with a new set of eyes because I keep experiencing things. Um, I don't write a lot of happy poems, (laughs) unfortunately. And I don't even want to say happy. I think that everything that I'm writing about is just very, very deep. It's, It's always a deep emotion. It can make you feel good but it's going to make you feel deeply in that, in that emotion. Um, Like the unveiling of God, my most recent film, that's not a sad film, but everybody who watches it says it makes them cry and it makes them process all these things. They're not sad. It's just a heavy thing, you know? So I try to make my work as emotional as possible. You know, I think that in this world is so plastic and microwavable. And I think that everybody is always like running from their emotions so I try to, you know, wake up the human inside of us all um, with everything that I create. We thank you for sharing that. And that leads to my next question. It's a segue. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think we all want to feel something. We all when we're doing whatever it is that we're doing, when we're creating whatever it is that we're creating, we we want to feel something. We want to share that feeling that, that that's what makes it real. And I I definitely agree with that sentiment of things feel too sanitized at times and too pristine. It's like, I I remember when I was younger and I used to do the edits for this podcast, I would go through and then like, let me get rid of all the ums. I was like, it's not a real conversation. It doesn't sound like a real conversation. It doesn't have that, that those rough edges or those bumps and abrasions within a conversation. I want those in there. I was like, can we put more of those in there, you know, as opposed to taking them out. (laughs) So, So tell me about the unveiling of God and how did the process perhaps differ from maybe previous projects and also in the, I guess, the um, the aftercare part of it. What were the feelings associated upon completing and and screening a film? Yeah, that was a two year process, Um, which can be normal in the film world or maybe not. I don't know. It was new for me. (laughs) (laughs) My previous film, A Black Girl's Country, took maybe about three months um, to get done and edit and everything. Um, So it was a different process. So the unveiling of God is a short film, 20 minutes long. The full title is the unveiling of God, a love letter to my forefathers. And the reason for that is it's a debt. It is a dedication to my father 
who has passed away and my grandfather who is still living and then all my other grandfathers and uncles who are also gone. And um, the reason for that was because I was really raised by women. Now, there were black men around me growing up, but I was raised by a lot of single women. And that's because their husbands had either passed away or they were no longer together, incarcerated. There were a, a bunch of different things. And I think that I was also raised by a lot of grieving black women because of that. So I really had this question this big question like who were these men that i came from right and i started to realize as an adult that not having a lot of black men in my life affected the way that i would now go and get into relationships with black men as an adult like imagine just not having any growing up and all of a sudden thinking that you can just function in a relationship and it'll be all good you know right. so that film was really me honoring them and learning more about them and also just asking the overall question about how I view black men and what how black men exist in our community and what is the relationship like with black men and women, because that doesn't get talked about enough. I feel like um, that relationship is in trouble, in my opinion. Yes. <laughs> so um, so that's that's what that film was about. So it featured all Baltimore artists. Uh, all the music is by Baltimore artists born and raised here. Uh, the entire film takes place in Baltimore. Everybody in it is from Baltimore and lives in Baltimore. It is definitely for Baltimore, that project. And it features dancers, portrait shots, um, uh, dirt bike riding, men in water, men swimming, a whole lot of things. Uh, it features fatherhood, men playing basketball, boxing, so many different things just to all like give you this gaze honoring the black man, but also asking questions and I'm saying poetry over it. Yeah. So releasing that, getting that off of my chest after two years of working, it was very scary, but it was, a, it was definitely a deep exhale to be able to release that, but also being nervous because I hadn't really seen a lot of work like it. Um, so yeah. And it's still, I still get nervous because it's in the film festival circuit. So it still has to be accepted. So it's still going to get some yeses and nos. It's still fairly new. So, yeah. <laughs> well, well, thank you for that. And thank you for um, doing that. Cause I, I agree with you that it is a complicated relationship, black men, black women that is uh, not talked about nearly enough. And um, just someone, you know, you uh, taking the, taking it on you. Like I, I do this thing where when someone's like, well, I didn't like this, so I didn't have this or whatever. I'm like, where's yours? Like, you know, where, where's your <laughs> version of it? And I always yeah. admire when someone takes on the task of, of making something and making something that is important and impactful to them. And like, I, I applaud it. And I not had the opportunity to, to see it. Yeah. I'm not one of the cool kids and I'm too friggin' busy. Um, <laughs> but, um, out of the stills that I've seen and the clips that I've seen, and I've seen like, you know, some, some family members and, uh, <laughs> and some friends and guests that have taken part of it. It looks beautiful and, you know, Thank much you. success for, for you and in, in doing that. And, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, just hearing you talk about it or what have you, I don't, I don't have any, I don't feel any sadness and granted, I haven't seen it yet. Right. But mm -hmm. it is a feeling of, Oh yeah, that's that's something that's needed. That's something that's important. That's that's what I'm feeling. Yeah. Based off very sparse information, <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. um, and really, and really showing showing that that form or what have you. There is a a moment where you know there there is a shift, and there needs to be more coverage, more uncovering of black people. You know, and showing us and showing all of our different shades. And that's the thing where I say it's it looks beautiful because it's like the stills yeah. is like, wow, they're getting all of these blacks. Hell yeah. All of that color. <laughs> wow, look at that, look at that color of brown. What kind of candy bar are you? Wow, this is great. Yeah. <laughs> so so tell me about a time um that someone gave you a shot that was like very influential in your development as a creator and as an artist. So I'm gonna say and this wasn't, my role wasn't huge, but the simple act of this was, was big enough for me as an artist. So I told you I work with Kirby Griffin a lot. And um, so he's a big time, he does, he's very humble, but he's a big time cinematographer, okay? <laughs> he was second camera on two films on Netflix and he, uh, I could be wrong, but he was 
DP and he was DP on Dark City Beneath the Beat, which is also on Netflix. Mm -hmm. He shot commercials um, for all types of companies, music videos. Um, you know, he's done it all. So he's I say I like to say he's been on a lot of big film sets. Sure. And he recently they shot in a commercial here for a big tech company. And he was second camera on that. And he called me and he just asked me if I was free. It was the day before. And I like called out of work. I was like, yeah, I'm sick. Can't come. <laughs> he was like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was like, I need, I want you to be my assistant on this. And that was my first time like being on a real set. It was just a commercial. Yeah. Um, but it was huge enough for me. And Bradford Young was the uh, director and the DP of that commercial. So I got to see him in action a little bit and just seeing all the moving pieces of a set like that was huge for me because every time we do these films or we do music videos, it's just me, Kirby and Nate or just me and Kirby. You know, it's not a lot of we don't have a lot of support. It's just us doing our best. Yeah. So I would say him trusting me and being his assistant, like getting me on uh, payroll and having me introduced to these people and witnessing that for myself. That was huge for me. And that kind of was his. He said it in a thousand different ways before, but that was just another way that he see this because I know that she'll be doing this one day as well. So that right there, yeah, I'll never forget that experience, even with me being an assistant. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's that's huge. It's, it's an endorsement. It's trust. It's acknowledgement. And um, yeah, I'm in this this spot where I've been doing this this podcast for almost three years, but podcasting is a whole journey for about thirteen and. I, I still get kind of jazzed up when someone's like endorsing it and like, Hey, let me connect you to this person or Hey, you ever think about doing this? It's like, wow, this is, this is great. Cause it shows that there's a, a buy in it. Someone cares. And I think one of the things you were touching on that when you're, you're working on something, it's usually just the three of y'all. And when it's a very DIY and you're getting out really good, good content, it's almost like, I said this to someone recently and it's like, wow, how are you getting out so many episodes? Because I think I put out an episode per day this month. And wow. I was like, imagine <laughs> me with a budget, you know, imagine me with an assistant, imagine exactly. me with another person. Yeah. And um, yeah, and I think just it has to come from you. And yeah, I, I applaud you and thank you for sharing that. Thank you. So so often, often we hear and this, this is this is this might be a little this might be a little controversial here. Often we hear <laughs> for the culture. What does the culture mean to you and what is the culture of, of Baltimore being that we're both, you know, from here, you're, you're West Side, mm, and I'm a little, I'm West yeah. Side. I, don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I am from West Baltimore, that's for sure. <laughs> but what is the culture of Baltimore? I we, I do hear for the for the, for the culture a lot. I can't even say it. Um but what does that what does that mean to you when someone throws it out? Because and I'm and I'm saying that because there are people that aren't necessarily for the culture who will say for the culture, and that's why I'm saying there's a little bit of controversy in there. You'll have mm -hmm. you know people who would tout it. You'll have people who are really hey, let me take a picture with you. You're an emerging black artist. Let me take a picture with you. But really, mm -hmm. they're not really for what's needed. <laughs> And I'm just saying it from my vantage point. I know nothing. I'm just a guy with a microphone. But um, what does like really f the culture or being for the culture mean to you? And and what is the culture of Baltimore like from a person that's from here? Yeah. So I never say that. I never say that phrase. And that's because I know what comes with it. Like you're saying, <laughs> it's so easy to hashtag anything or to to pretend to be an ally easily. Um, for me personally, what I would like for, for the culture to mean is, uh, to really be for the community. And that means to serve the community and you also have to exist in the community to really be for it. So there are a lot of people I know, like Sharena Ashanti Christmas is a, a great example. This is a woman who has served the community for years. She's not even originally from here. She's from New York. She moved here. I think she's, she's been here for a long time. I don't want to say what number because, but I know it's been a day more than a decade. She's been here literally serving this community and she never really has a camera up about it. And mm -hmm. a lot of people don't necessarily know the work that she's doing because of that. Now she's gotten a lot of coverage and things, but this is someone I've seen do so much for the youth. I mean, she has a program where they travel all over the place and you know, there's a lot of other people I can name people who are really in it 
you know, who don't need a camera, who, who don't want to be seen doing it. They want to do it because they love the people. Yeah. And I think a lot of, for me, for the culture is also about being honest. Um, it's being truthful in how you represent people and uh, being truthful and holding each other accountable. Cause that's a huge thing that's missing is accountability. Yeah. And um, when I think about the culture of Baltimore, I was just thinking about this when I was listening to a couple of artists. I was listening to Zadia and I was listening to Miss Cam. And Baltimore doesn't really have a, a musical sound, but I was thinking like so much of Baltimore music has to do with survival. And um, this beauty, not in necessarily in struggling, but this beauty in surviving. Yeah. And there's also this spirituality that goes with it. And one thing that Zadia said was sunsets over the vacants. And I love that because it's like there's this always this juxtaposition of Baltimore where it's just this beautiful, beautiful. I don't know how to explain it, like this beautiful I, energy of surviving and this vibrancy that these people have. Like there's nobody like Baltimore people like we're hilarious, you know, just yeah. resilient in so many ways. But there's also so many demons and uh, systemic obstacles that have been put in our way that are that really leave like this darkness over the city as well so when I think about the culture I just think it's it's just this rawness and there's this pure beauty that's there too and um, again when I try to show up for Baltimore I try to be honest the unveiling of God when I say that every every musician was a Baltimore musician every musician was paid you know they got whatever they wanted to do whatever they asked for you know, we tried to represent everybody as they truly are. We didn't want to get over on anybody or use anybody for clout or anything like that. We really wanted to be true. And um, just like with the BMA, a black girl's country was bought by the BMA, but we, we fought to make sure that it was still available on YouTube because the community comes first. That's who needs to see it. Yeah. And if the community can't get to the BMA or if it's not up at the time, they can still go to YouTube and still access that film because that's who it's truly for. So again, I think it's just about putting the cameras down and being honest and doing the work and existing in it as well. You can't just be for the culture at one point and then leave. You have to fully exist and be there with the people. So that was a long answer, but. <laughs> no, I, I, I prefer the real answer. And I, yeah. you know, 100% on that, uh, you know, like I'm from here. I have seen people who come in and, you know, you can be a transplant come here and really be about it or what have you, you know, as you would describe it with Shireen or what have you, who's been on the podcast. Uh, oh, shout yeah. out, shout out to Morgan, shout out to Morgan yeah. gang. And, um, and then you'll have people who look at uh, even with the reputation here, you know, that, that I think is undeserved. Um, I think it, well, I think it's incomplete. I'll say that. Um, mm -hmm. but people will come here and try to be attached to it because of the authenticity, that versatility, that vibrancy that you were describing. And it's like, Oh yeah, I can get my bones here. I can be somebody here and yeah. I can, you know, take from this. And then suddenly they were previously Baltimore based or they, they moved to Brooklyn or they moved to wherever. And that's yeah. fine. That's their prerogative. But it's, it's just really interesting because I think what we do here is we're very, authentic about it and we'll call you on it. We'll hold you accountable for it. And yeah. there are a fair amount of people who want to be the face of this and the face of that for the cameras and for the clout that do not live in Baltimore, that live in like Baltimore County. It's like, yeah, I'm from Owens Mills. It's like, you are from Owens Mills. You are not from Baltimore. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, had, I clap back really quickly. I'm from East Baltimore. I, I clap back very quickly with it. <laughs> um, so, you know, also being a proud Baltimorean it, um, and, and you make that very much a part of your work as you were describing. So, again, why, why is that important? And, and, and how does the r reputation of Baltimore kind of shift more towards featuring that community of great artists, makers and creative? How does that get more attention than, like I said before, like I feel like the narrative about Baltimore is incomplete. So how do we maybe shift more attention towards the not necessarily the good stuff when people talk about this podcast oh you're doing something positive I'm like now mm -hmm. i'm doing something real like it's baked in so yeah. how do we shift the focus more on to a more holistic point of view about the city i think that that will come from the artists mm -hmm. and i was just talking to another great artist kondwani fidel yesterday and he was saying how um you know, the artists are the people who hold Baltimore down. Those are the people that are always going to love Baltimore unconditionally. 
and are always going to put forth the, the true narrative, the real narrative. And they're going to do it with love. Even if the truth hurts, it's always going to be with love. And he was saying how, you know, we have politicians, transplants. They come in here, police, and they let us down all the time. All the time. All the time they let us down. But the artists never do that. And I think that the way to shift the narrative of Baltimore is to trust the artists and to put that in the hands of the artists. There's so many artists we've had in Baltimore going back all the way back to the Chitlin circuit, <laughs> you know, back in the day when Pennsylvania Avenue was what it was, you know, the artists have always valued this city. Mm. And I think that, you know, we need a platform. So whatever space we have or whatever opportunity we have to uplift these artists, that is how the narrative changes. Those are the people that are going to do it. And I can throw cultural workers in there as well. Um, people who have, a, again, an unconditional love for it that are going to hold it accountable, that are going to introduce things that could help the city grow and also going to handle it with absolute care and love. Um, we need to be in control of the narrative. And that's very hard sometimes because, of course, we have, again, big networks come in. They can do whatever they want because they have the budget and they get the OK from whoever they need. But again, um, I think that we just have to keep creating and keep giving the opportunity wherever we can because we are Baltimore. Yeah. I, and I, I think that's why what I'm doing here as a Baltimorean, been here all 30, 70 years. And it, it's when I thought about like who has the temperature on it, I try to talk to you if I, if I have a politician on, if I have a developer on or someone that doesn't really fit into the small business or to the artists as cultural or cultural workers kind of space. Then it's like, look, I'm really vetting you. It's like, look, I'm, you know, like, are you on my radar? Why are you on my radar? That's literally yeah. the way I look at it. But the majority of the people I try to have on here, you know, I've talked to different curators. It's like, how'd you get this person? I was like, because I, I bang for that work. How can mm -hmm. I have them on? How can I have them tell their story? Why Why don't more people know about this person? Why do more people not know about Nia Jim? <laughs> so... You know, that's that's kind of what that is, what have you. And, you know, I think it's, it's, it's again going back to one of the things you touched on with like the BMA. It's like if I'm going to do something and work work with somebody in this capacity that has it, if that moves the needle in this direction. Look, we can recalibrate, we can do whatever, but I need to have a certain amount of say that this stays what it is. Yeah, exactly. You no, know, it's like this is, you know, it's like be savvy, because I think at times I used to ask people who is the pop culture representative for Baltimore. And it's kind of a, it's kind of a rhetorical question. I don't know if there's one because sometimes that authenticity gets in our way and it prevents it from really going up to a super crossover level. There are opportunities, but you know, I don't know if anyone is truly moving to that high transcendent level that people know they're from Baltimore. You know, we yeah. will claim people that are ours, but not too many people will know. And I think it's like, what is that balance there? And it, like, I agree. It's the it's the artist. It has to come from the artist. They're speaking yep. on really what's happening here. Yeah. And they do it cool too. <laughs> they do it in a cool yeah. way as well. Uh, so this is the last real question I have for you. And then I'm going to get to trolling you because I got you know like rapid oh, fire God. questions. Uh, <laughs> so lastly, we like to enrich people here. Um, can you recommend a book or, or something that's had like some influence on your career and in what ways has it influenced you? Mm. Well, the biggest influence is uh, for color girls who have considered suicide when the rainbow is enough. It is a choreo poem written by written and choreographed by Inazaki Shange, um, an ancestor. She was a, spoken word artist she was a poet a writer a dancer a filmmaker <laughs> she mm. is like mm. my mother in that way <laughs> yes and that book really changed my life because it again she really incorporated all of these disciplines and put it onto one stage she even put it on the page you can literally see the the words moving um almost the way the dancers would move right and I think it's a beautiful book on the experiences of black women. And it talks about the power of what it, it talks about the power of black women being in community and what that can do to their healing process. And I'm actually teaching a class on it plug nice. <laughs> with uh, new generation scholars, which is under one of the organizations news 360. I talked about, we, we have a free Institute that we just launched and 
Um, it's free all online. The, the registration link is in my bio. It's for adults and youth ages 13 and up. And I'm teaching a class on it. And yeah, I'm excited. But all that information is on my page. Um, but yeah. Okay. So we'll we'll get to our shameless plugs at the the end here, just to, yeah. to highlight that <laughs> and bring some attention there. Yeah. Um, so I got I got four rapid fire questions for you. Okay. All right. So you know how rapid fire works. You know how rapid fire works. So some people give me the long like. Here's my essay on this question. I was like, <laughs> it's like rapid fire, fool. No. <laughs> All right. What is that one word that you believe to be the most powerful word in the English dictionary? Well, the English language, rather. Love. Okay. This this is this is definitely a checking one. This is a, a Baltimore card one. Uh oh. Baltimore or be more. Baltimore. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know. A lot of people who say be more. <laughs> a lot of them ain't from here. <laughs> I just see it written. Okay. I look. I look at the side. I was like, "Where are you from again? Oh, you from Kentucky? Cool. <laughs> that's that's cool. Bet." Uh, d- describe your work in three words or less. And I know it's going to be challenging because <laughs> it's probably thirty words and <laughs> okay. in three words or less. Yeah. Okay. Uh, honest, delicate, black. Yeah, you, you passed that one. <laughs> All right. So this is the last one I have for you. Um, what is your favorite film? Oof. Now that's the one that's going to take some time. <laughs> one favorite film? Just one? Well, well, it doesn't have to be your top. Throw, throw out... Um, because I know that can be hard because people don't have favorite films I'm learning. I find that people have like, <laughs> here's my top 10. It's like, didn't ask. Uh, what are what are three of your favorite films? I'll, I'll make it a little bit easier. Okay, yes. Black Orpheus. Love okay. Black Orpheus. Um, Crooklyn. That's a good one. Yeah. Shoot. I'm looking at my DVDs. <laughs> nice. Uh, Love is the message and the message is death. I'm going to throw that one in there. Okay. That's a short film. Okay. See, I, I like how you you did the filmmaker thing. Just like, here's a short film for y'all who don't know, <laughs> who aren't in the know. I'm like, all right, then, cool. There, there was no neck movement like I just did, but there was enough in there from how you said it. So, thanks to you on that. Um, so, yeah, thank you. Um, and I, I, um, I appreciate you coming on to the pod. And um, I want to invite you and encourage you to tell the fine folks where to check out you, your work, all of that good stuff. And, again, thank you for being on this podcast. Yes, yes. So thank you for having me. I was telling everybody about it because I know so many people who have come on here and I was like, I'm going on the podcast. <laughs> but my Instagram is Nia June Poetry. That's N-I-A, June like the month, and then poetry, all one word. Same thing on Twitter. I don't really be on Twitter like that, but you know, I'm there. I'll see it like a couple weeks later if you mention me or anything. And Facebook is the same, Nia June, YouTube, Vimeo, Nia June. Nice. <laughs> So for the great Nia June, I am Rob Lee saying that there's art in and around Baltimore. You just got to look for it. <laughs> <laughs>